Welcome to the campaign strategy section of my Warriors of Chaos guide. In this section of the guide, I will go over the overall pros and cons of the Chaos campaign, my personal experience with it, the different factions, and their unique aspects, and finally, any unique mechanics that the faction has. I'll put timestamps on screen now to each part of the guide, so you can skip to which bit is relevant to you if you wish to do so. But first, I'd like to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which is BenQ. Now BenQ were kind enough to send me one of their screen bar e-reading lamps and it is the world's first lamp that is specifically designed for digital screen time. It's really useful for when you're trying to work long hours in front of computers or if you just spend a lot of your time sat in front of a screen, chilling, playing games, anything like that. It has an auto dimming feature which uses the ambient light sensor which is built into the top of the bar to adjust the brightness level automatically and instantly but the brightness can also be manually set by using the button which is on the top. It's also a really great option if you don't have a lot of desk space, it simply clicks onto the top of pretty much any monitor and then you just need to plug it into a USB port and it is good to go. It's also pretty much glare free, you can have something dark on your screen and have this light shining pretty much directly on it and you're not going to get any glare. It also has an adjustable colour temperature so you can use warm light for when you want to relax and give your eyes a rest and you can use the bluer cooler light when you want to concentrate and stay awake. If you want to pick up one of these for yourself, check out the links in the description, it's about $99 in the US and about £89 in the UK. Big thanks to BenQ for sponsoring this video and sending me out the lamp, and now, back to the guide. Disclaimer. This guide is based on my personal experiences and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. In my time playing the Warriors of Chaos, the thing that stuck out to me the most was their lack of unique features. Just look at the bottom right of the screen and see how empty it is compared to some other factions, and you can see how much they've been neglected. They were the first Horde faction in the game, and aside from that they haven't had anything added to them since that helps them stand out. Speaking of the Horde mechanic, it is actually quite fun and powerful once you get going. The ability to recruit units wherever you go is extremely strong, especially if you're on the move as much as these guys. Unfortunately, the downside of this is that if you ever lose one of your armies, you also end up losing all of the buildings that army was carrying around, which can be a serious blow to your progress. The lack of settlements comes with its ups and downs. Yes, you have no lands of your own to defend, but you also have no economy to support, meaning you must rely on constant fighting to keep yourself afloat. Luckily, Chaos have a lot of skills that make raiding and raising insanely profitable, meaning if there is stuff to fight, you should never run out of money, provided you can win all your battles. Being a horde faction also comes with the added bonus of not having to worry about public order, which means taking the Sword of Cain for all it's worth is a no-brainer. Yes, the extra upkeep can be a lot to manage, but as I said, you can make a ton by fighting, and with the Sword of Cain, you will easily win those fights. Finally, one last thing the Chaos has going for them is the corruption mechanic. I'll go over this in more detail later, but basically, you create it wherever you go, and it makes the land very difficult to settle on, meaning it's not as easy to recolonize after you've been there. I'll now go over my personal experience with the Chaos campaign to give you some ideas to what you might expect. For the purposes of the guide, I played as Kolek, as voted for by the Discord. If you want to be a part of these votes in the future, or just get in contact with me and other players in the community, then be sure to join the Discord from the link below. The campaign started off at Bear Sunling's camp, where I immediately set out awakening one of the Norskan tribes by rolling over the ones already living there. I cleaned up the rest of the resident faction and started to make my move towards the northwest in search of more tribes to awaken. I decided this was more important than bothering to take on the dwarves, since they were far too much work for pretty much zero gain, and I also really didn't have the units to take on dwarves, so I'd rather not sit and wait around until I did. Once I made my way past the dwarves, I found a whole host of Norsecan tribes to take on, and you best believe Kulik and I took them on and rolled straight over them. I'll spare you every single detail, but all you need to know is we tore through the area, awakening tribes where possible and slaughtering Norsecans where it wasn't. We managed to awaken enough so that I could recruit Sigvald and send him across the sea to the northwestern continent to take on the Norskans there. It took quite a few turns to get it all unified and under control because of a certain Norskan faction continually confederating my tribes, but eventually I got it all under control and set out south into the Empire of Man. It's no surprise to anyone that the Empire took up the majority of the time in my campaign. They're infamous for their ability to funnel resources into a million armies before confederating to create even more resources and armies. And would you believe it? That's exactly what they did! I burned my way from the north, raising as many settlements as I could, but they kept colonising and confederating like a diplomatic cockroach. It took a whole bunch of turns of lightning striking their armies one by one and taking out exposed settlements, but eventually I managed to kill them fast enough that they couldn't confederate, and I could tick them off my list of factions who needed to die. In the midst of this massive amount of turns, a couple things happened. I sent an expedition over to Ulthuan to get the Sword of Cain from Alariel, which honestly proved to be incredibly easy, seeing as the High Elves put up a surprisingly low amount of resistance. I chose to give the sword to a generic lord, seeing as all of my legendary lords have their own weapons that are unique to them, and they don't really need it. Once I had the sword and was done farming high elf settlements for Cashola, 
I began the arduous journey back to the Empire, which took me through Bretonian lands. This was the one large mistake of my campaign. I started attacking Bretonia seeing as I was moving through the lands anyway, and while I was doing some good damage and taking out a few settlements, I wasn't doing it fast enough to actually take them out, meaning I was just wasting time rather than focusing them down or the Empire one at a time. I eventually realised this and sent all my lords back to the north and gained the aforementioned victory. Another thing that happened during this Empire invasion was my unlocking of Archeon by sacrificing 10 sets of battle captives. Of course, I immediately recruited him and sent him out to assist in the raising of the Empire's, well, Empire. I know this isn't the Lords and Heroes section, but I have to say, each of the three legendary lords are pretty damn good in battle, and I'll be damned if they aren't cuties either. Anyway, once I'd finished taking out the Empire, I turned my attention to Bretonia, and it was honestly the most underwhelming conclusion to a campaign I've had for a long, long time. I pretty much marched in there, auto resolved my way to their capital, and met basically no resistance. Once they were taken out completely, I completed Archeon's last mission and accepted my short victory for what it was. Very short indeed. That would be the part where I grow over the different factions, their starting preferences and unique mechanics. Unfortunately for the Chaos Boys, they only have one faction, and honestly, if you squint, you can't really tell the difference between any of these lads. You know what? Let me bring in an expert. Archeon the Everchosen, born as Diedrich Kastner, he was once a proud follower of Sigmar himself. Diedrich's own self-hatred led to his fall, and through that Archeon was born, a terrible man who not only sought to destroy civilization as we know it, but to also rule the world as a self-styled god-king. Over many years, he attained the blessings of all four Chaos Gods, and amassed a horde so large it would eventually bring the end of the Warhammer fantasy world, living up to the name of Lord of the End Times. Kolek Sun Eater, firstborn of Krakenrock the Black. Kolek was there when the Dragon Ogre race sold their very souls to the Dark Gods. Every eight generations he awakens from his slumber to wreak havoc on the Warhammer fantasy world. So powerful is this being, he is known to tower over walls and crush them as if they were as strong as paper. This is a being of pure destruction. Many times have the people of Kislev felt the unbridled fury of Kolek's Sun Eater. Sigvald the Magnificent, favoured son of Sunesh. The personification of beauty on the outside, but horribly disgusting on the inside. Born of a union of a warlord and his own sister, Sigvald was marked for greatness under the eyes of the ruinous powers as soon as he was born. He leads a legion of utterly devoted followers who would happily give their lives for him should he so wish it. Indeed, those who follow him into battle are handpicked by himself. His followers cannot be too beautiful, as none should rise above him in the eyes of Sunesh. They can also not be too ugly, for they might be too unsightly for his own eyes. He has devoted himself to the Dark Prince of Pleasure, and strives to reach new levels of cruelty with each passing day. Okay, well they might be slightly different. Anyway, they all do start in the same corner, near Bear Sunling's camp, but they obviously have no starting settlement, or any settlement for that matter. This means that you don't have climate preferences, so feel free to go wherever you fancy. But beware, you still do suffer attrition when going over deep waters or through vampiric corruption, so just be careful where you're going. Depending on which lord you pick, you do get some slight effects to different areas of the campaign. Picking Archeon grants minus 30 recruitment cost and plus 10 leadership for Chaos Warriors, and minus 30 relations with all factions. Choosing Kolik will grant all characters plus 4 Chaos Corruption, minus 60% recruitment cost for Dragon Ogre units, and minus 20% ambush defense chance. Finally, picking up good old Siggy will grant you plus 20 relations with Norska, plus 15 leadership when fighting against men, and plus 15 armor for lords and heroes. As for expansion, even though you aren't expanding per se, I do have a few tips on where I found was the best route to take. I definitely think taking it over the north is the best course of action to start off with, so you just have someone to assist you and hold on to the top of the map. Once this is done, you want to take on the Empire and focus on them, aside from maybe rushing for the Sword of Cain. Once you've had your fill of the Empire, then the Bretonians are right next door and will be a breeze in comparison. If you're going for the Long Victory, then you can either go for the Dwarves or the High Elves from here, and honestly, they're about as far away as each other, so I'll leave that one down to you. The Research Tree of the Faction is something I did end up liking. It has tiers that get more and more expensive as you go along, each tier you unlock grants you more casualty replenishment and horde growth rate, as well as unlocking the path to better research projects. The projects take longer as you go up, and pretty much all of them are to do with improving your units, since there's bugger all else they can do. As you get higher, the units you're improving get more high tier, as well as the odd project about making more money or having more movement range. Honestly, it is a super standard research tree, just without anything to do with infrastructure. 
Now we come to the faction mechanics, and as I mentioned at the start, this will not take very long, since they have three whole mechanics, and only one of them is unique to them. First off is the horde mechanic. I've talked about this a little already, so I'll go over this fairly quickly. The faction cannot inhabit settlements, and instead works in a system similar to the ship building mechanic from the Vampire Coast, where your armies act as mobile settlements with different buildings available for construction. Since the Warriors of Chaos are totally focused on fighting, these buildings are basically all to unlock new units, with a few exceptions affecting your upkeep and recruit rank, and increasing your capacity for hero units. These buildings also cost money and growth points, which are gained by accumulating enough horde growth, which is gained every turn and by raising settlements. Now this lack of settlements does come with some benefits. You don't have anything to protect when you're moving around a lot, and all of your recruitment buildings are with you, so you can recruit units pretty much wherever you go. But it also has a lot of downsides, such as a complete lack of passive income, meaning if you stop fighting, you start hemorrhaging money and need to continue battling to survive. It also means if you lose an army, you will lose all the buildings and growth it had, meaning you have to start all over again with a fresh army, even if it's a legendary lord. This encourages you to play very cautiously and only fight battles you know you can win, which is a very patient and calculated strategy, but also a rewarding one. One final thing to note about the horde mechanic is attrition. If you have two or more armies too close to each other, then they will start to suffer attrition from infighting. This is here to discourage sending around all your armies in a massive death ball, but to be honest, if you need more than one army for a job, you can just spread them out while moving and then have them together for just a couple of turns to fight. This mechanic is even more pointless once you see that the Warriors of Chaos have one of the fastest replenishment rates I've ever seen, so if you start to take a lot of attrition damage, simply move away your armies and they'll be full health in no time. The other faction mechanic they have access to is Chaotic Corruption, and to be honest, calling it mechanic is giving it a little too much credit. Essentially, all that happens is, wherever you go you spread Chaotic Corruption, and once you've spread it enough, it starts to affect the public order of anyone settled in the area. If the public order gets bad enough, then the affected settlements will get Chaotic Rebellions, that will attack their source settlements, and 9 out of 10 times will die trying. It's meant to act as a deterrent for factions looking to colonise as you raise, but all it really does is hassle their happiness for a while, and feed their units some levels with a tasty rebellion. Finally, the last feature they have is the Tribes Awakening mechanic. Essentially, all it does is allow you to summon Norskan tribes upon raising a Norskan settlement. In my experience, you can summon up to three of these guys, but to be honest, having just one controlling the entire area works best, so I wouldn't bother once you have Sigi unlocked. These summoned factions act like any other Norskan faction, but are your vassals, meaning they have a military alliance with you and provide you with gold per turn. They can also be confederated by other Norskan factions, so if you aren't careful, you just end up feeding a faction armies and settlements, so be sure that you can protect them once they're summoned. Again, this feature is super basic and very outdated in the current game. As I've said many times so far, the Warriors of Chaos have been barely touched since launch, so are barren of any actually interesting features. And that concludes this section of the guide on campaign strategy. The next section will cover the unit roster, and how I believe each unit is best used, so stay tuned for that. Don't forget to vote in the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description. If you want to check out the other parts, this or any other guide, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist to the series. If you enjoyed this video at any point, then please do consider leaving a like, as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, it is free. One last huge thanks to BenQ for sponsoring this video, and also massive thanks to the Great Book of Grudges for providing the law for this video. You can check out his channel in the description. For now though, I was Colonel Damnders, and I'll see you next turn.